Now we're starting. We'll go small. And we'll hide the menu. Maybe. Maybe we'll start. All right, there we go. So uh, if you remember last. Oops. Remember the last page? He said, Uncle Art Artham, help! And then he jumped off the tree. He's going to force his uncle to jump and save him. Amidst a chorus of gasps, flapping wings, and shouts, Janner heard his uncle's screech and felt his strong arms snatch him from the air. He felt a rush of wind, was blinded for a moment by sunlight, and before he knew it, he was set lightly on the roof of the great hall. The leafy branches on the great tree rose out of the roof like trees themselves, and though Janner could still faintly hear shouting in the hall below, birdsong filled the air. To the east, as far as he could see, lay green hills and valleys dotted with trees and patches of farmland. Here and there a cottage sat under a shady tree like a sleepy dog. To the south and west were the shingled roofs of Banrana, then the harbor the cliff walls of the water crawl, and beyond it, the dark sea of darkness. The sun was sailing up in, into mid-morning, and Janner had to squint to see Artham, a winged silhouette crowned by a muss of white hair. Thank you, Janner, his voice quivered, quavered, but it was Ar Artham who spoke, not Pete. You just have to remember, Janner said, taking his uncle's hand. You're the throne warden. It, it's remembering that's the problem, lad, Artham um, smiled, but his tone was bitter. There are things I want to forget, but I can't. Things I've yet to atone for. Janner's smile faded. What things? Artham put, shook his head. I prefer that you remember me as a good man, not a coward. Janner didn't understand. His uncle had saved him time and time again fought the fangs at every turn without care for himself. How could anyone ever think of him as a coward? Janner didn't, uh, as a coward. The commotion in the great hall below their feet increased, and Janner could hear people climbing the steps towards the roof. Artham, listen, whatever you're talking about doesn't matter. I love you. We all do. You wouldn't if you knew, Artham said as he moved to the edge of the roof and spread his wings. I have to go. I'll only cause you trouble. Please, don't go. We need you. This land, these hills might be the last safe place in all of where we are. You'll go to school. You'll have friends. You'll read books. Janner, the library in Van Rana is magnificent. It tra I traveled here many times in my youth to study the poets. You finally have a home. Don't you see? You're... You'll have trouble enough convincing them to free Kalmar without these ridiculous wings stirring up trouble. Footsteps thudded up the stairs and the voices rose. Besides, I never knew when I'll, I'll bart stabbling. Start babbling, Janner said quiet. Start babbling, Janner said quietly. You see, Artham hung his head and his left eye twitched. I fear I shall never be healed. Tears stung Janner's eyes. He didn't want to live in a world without Artham watching over him, always appearing when, the needed, when they needed him most. But he could see a sadness in Artham's eyes. He resolved that he couldn't, couldn't be shaken. Where will you go? Artham drew a hand over his face and whispered, as far as from the black wood as possible. Why? What's in the black wood? Danner asked. I'll go to Scree. Artham put a hand on Janner's shoulder and forced a smile. Gammon and his men could use a flying birdman on their side. I'll see what trouble I can stir up on the other side of the sea, where trouble might do some good. Now that you're safe, I should go where I'm needed. But you are needed, Janner wiped his nose. I need you. There's the beast, a man shouted from the doorway. He held a battle axe in both hands and edged forward while more hollows folks with weapon, weapons, men and women alike, crowed, crowded in behind him. We'll have no cloven in the hollows, do you hear? None! Artham, 
dropped to a knee, wrapped his strong arms around Tanner. Make her bless you, lad. Take care of your brother. Be a better warden than I. You have Poto and Nia, and though it may not see, seem so, the people of the Green Hollows are good-hearted and noble in their way. They will be. They will make a fine home. Goodbye. Janner looked into Artham's deep eyes. He thought about the day on the rope bridge, high in the trees of Glipwood Forest, when Pete the Sockman had invited them to his castle in the boughs. Even then he had seen a great sorrow in those eyes. Why did the madness creep into his mind even now, even after his mighty transformation? And what, oh, and what lurked in the black wood that frightened even Artham P. Wingfeather? It made Janner think of his old fear of Glipwood Forest, and that made him think of their journey to Dugtown, and that made him think of the Fork Factory, and that made him think of a girl with beautiful eyes set like jewels in her soot-covered face. Art Ham, listen. Uncle Art Ham, listen. There's a place in Dugtown called the Fork Factory, Janner said. It's full of slaves, children. Not for long, Artham said with a wink. There's a girl there. Her name's Sarah Cobbler. Janner's cheeks flushed. Will you find her? She helped me escape. Tell her. Tell her thank you for me, from me. Ar Artham smiled. You have my word. You're a precious jewel, my boy. Your father would be proud. The Hollows folks rushed forward, swinging their weapons. Without taking their eyes off Janner, Arham flapped his wings and rose. He flew back and away from the great hall, squatting away arrows, swatting away arrows as if as if they were sticks thrown by children. Janner watched through tears until his uncle disappeared behind a cloud. Turale. Janner was astonished by how quickly the Hollows folk calmed down. Minutes after it was clear that Artham was gone, the mob of burly men and fierce women filed back downstairs, sheathed their weapons or smothered or smoothed their dresses, and sat in the great hall to resume the council. When Janner reached his family at the root of the tree, they huddled around him and peppered him with whispers. Are you all right? Nia asked. Sakes alive. That was a reckless move, boy. Well done, said Oscar. Poto squeezed Janner's shoulder. You're lucky a mad bird didn't drop ye. Where is he? asked Lily. The others quieted and looked at Janner. He's gone. For good? Poto asked. I don't know. There was a moment of silence while they took in their snooze, and Janner realized the assembly had grown quiet too. Nia turned her attention back to the council. Rudrick, I ask your forgiveness. Ar Artham carries a great weight in his heart, and sometimes it is too much for him. Rudrick was seated on his throne again, and Janner sensed a quiet kindness in him that he wanted to trust. We all, we all carry burdens, Queen. But not all of us sprout wings or grow fur. The green hollows have remained safe from Nag's blackness only because of our strength, our vigilance, and our determination to empty the hollows of anything that might threaten our peace. You must understand, Highness, that we mean no disrespect to you, your station, or Anira itself, when I tell you we cannot allow a gray fang to walk on our streets. Janner's heart sank at the hollows folks muttered in agreement. Nia's speech, oops, I went the wrong way. Beep, beep, beep. Uh, um, we cannot, I tell you, we can't allow a gray fang to walk our streets. Janner's heart sank as the Hollows folk were muttered in agreement. Nia's speech might have swayed the ruling, but Artham's madness had ruined Kalmar's chance. Is there nothing I can say to convince you that my son is as safe and sane as he ever was? Nia asked. Are you telling me I have to choose between my homeland and my child? And what assurance have we that he is, as you say, safe and sane? Rudrick countered. Janner was troubled by the shameful thought that he wasn't sure. He knew his brother's heart was healing, if not whole, but if Kalmar carried the same shadow of guilt or fear or madness that Uncle Artham did, and something triggered it, 
would the little gray fang become as wild as Artham had only moments ago? Would he hurt someone? Danner's wounds were painful reminders of what Kalmar was capable of. I will vouch for him, Nia said. I declare Turule. The assembly erupted in gasp. <gasps> you got your all erupt in gasp. Tanner didn't know what Turle was, but it caused the blood to drain from Rudrick's face. Poto took Nia's hand and tried to pull her back to her seat, but she yanked away from him and approached the throne. She knelt before Rudrick, who shrank against the back of his chair. Janner heard him say in a quiet, urgent voice, Nia, please, this isn't the way. But Nia's anger was kindled, and she declared it again. Turule! The cries of the crowd deteriorated into a cacophony of shouting. Some shook their fists and said, Let her vouch! Others shook their heads, saying, Not the queen! Not the queen! Finally, Rudrick, with a grave expression, held up his hands for order. The queen, he said, has declared Turule. Bring the gray fang. The doors swung open, and another cage was rolled into the hall. At first it looked empty, but Janner spotted a little gray heap in the corner. So small, it looked like a crumpled blanket. The crowd watched in silence as the cage was placed at the foot of the mound between two sweeps of a tree root. Kalmar, it's going to be all right, Lily said, and her voice was like music. We're all here. The little heap stirred, and two trembling ears appeared, then two blue eyes and a wet black nose. Kalmar held himself tightly, shivering as if he were cold or sick. Then he saw Lily, then Nia, and the others. He whined. Janner's heart ached. He fought the urge to tear open the cage and flee with his brother. Uh-oh. I want to keep reading. Uh, Rudrick dusted off an ornate bo wooden box beside the throne, opened it, and removed a dagger. Without a word, the seven men and women of the council came forward and flanked Rudrick. Nia, was, who seemed to know exactly what to do, stood between them and held out her right hand, palm upward. Nia Wingfeather, Queen of Anira, Rudrick said in a loud voice, you have invoked Turule for the sake of the Grey Fang, whom you call son. I do, and I regret it not, she said. Then before the chiefs of Ban Hin, Ban Rugen, Ban Rorna, Ban Vinnick, Ban Soran, Ban Verda, and the Outer Vales, you vouch for, for the Grey Fang. Oops. You vouch for the... Gray Fang. His name is Kalmar Wingfeather, Nia said, and I will hold you in contempt until you call him thus. Rudrick glanced at the chief. Chiefs, in all his strength, he seemed small before Nia. Very well. You vouch for Kalmar Wingfeather. You hold your life forfeit for his. And should, should he break the life laws of the Green Hollows from this day forward, it is not only his blood that I will shed, but yours. He stepped closer to Nia and lowered his voice. You mustn't do this thing. The fangs, I'm sorry, the boy is wild. I heard him last night in the dungeon howling like an animal. His claws were bloodied from scraping at the stone. And this is only the beginning. You saw the other fang in time. The boy too will descend. I know it. And not only will my, he hurt someone, he'll kill. He'll be lost and you'll be lost with him. Please, Nia, there's no changing this. He's my son, Nia said. Her eyes burned into Rudrick's until he looked away. Turule, Rudrick said at last, and he drew the knife blade across Nia's palm. She didn't flinch. The keeper of the hollows took Nia's wrist and held up her bleeding hand for the assembly to see. Hollows folk, before these witnesses, has the ancient law been invoked? Beneath the branches of the ancient tree has the oath been made. Let Bud's blood seal the freedom of the captive. Let it be, answered the assembly. Rudrick released Nia's hand and stepped aside. She walked forward and placed her palm against the tree, trunk of the great giant tree 
and Janer noticed for the first time that there were many other palm prints faced, faded with age, dappling the smooth bark above the throne. Blood trickled down her wrist and flowed into the bark of the tree until she was satisfied and held her hand out again for all to see. Now in the name of my, my father, Poto Helmer, my grandfather, Cargan Igby, his father, Janer, Janiber Igby, and in the name of the maker himself, release my son. The guards unlatched the cage and the door creaked open. Kalmar, come. Nia said. Kalmar blinked and cocked his head sideways, looking from Nia to the guards and back again, like a scared puppy. Without a thought for what the council would think, Janner ran to the cage, stepped in, and carried his brother out. He stood with his family at the base of the tree and watched as the hollow folk filed out of the hall in silence. Rudrick appeared with bandages for, for Nia's hand. Poto took him with a stiff nod and wrapped his daughter's wound. Rudrick cleared his throat and struggled to look Nia in the eye. That didn't go as I had hoped. Little does, Nia said, looking away. Oscar shook his head and stared at the floor. Kalmar was free, but at the cost of Nia's own life, should his recklessness or foolishness, or even some deeper, uncontrollable impulse, get him into trouble. And trouble, Janner thought, was a, with a feeling of dread was something Kalmar never managed to avoid. Besides all that, Uncle Artham, their fiercest protector, was gone. Come, children, Nia said. She helped Lily to her feet, kissed Kalmar on the forehead, and led them uh, out of the room. As they stepped into the sunlight, Janner glanced back at Rudrick. He slept on his throne. He slept on his throne and watched them leave. Above his head, Nia's bloody handprint glistened on the tree. Dun, dun, dun. So that was 11 and 12. 